All right, welcome to our Canandaigua Lake Trout Unlimited April meeting. Uh, we have a really good program tonight. Our, our once again, our Zoom meetings, how we've been doing this this year, which have worked out pretty well for us because we get folks from all over the place coming rather than just uh, having to drive. So, uh, and tonight's uh, theme is uh, we're gonna do the, our Women's Invitational and a uh, uh, segment on Casting for Recovery. And so here's our program tonight. Uh, we open our virtual doors as we call it. When we used to meet in person, we met at the uh, American Legion Hall in Canandaigua and we'd always open the doors at 6.30. And, and so now we open our virtual doors. Um, and uh, go through our usual, uh, our meetings, uh, we'll, show some uh, fishing photos and uh, get some reports and um, do some other updates. Uh, Al will give us an update on our conservation efforts. And, uh, and then we'll go in and do our two uh, main parts of the programs, our Women's Invitational with uh, Lisa Green, who she's our uh, regional vice president in PU, and also Casting for Recovery with our, our other Lisa, Lisa Abel. <laughs> and so we always like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So let me remove your hats if you got them. And um, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America, America and to the Republic, to the Republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty, justice, justice for all. Okay, thank you. All right, we always like to show some fishing photos. I haven't seen Scott's uh, join the meeting yet, but uh, this is a client of his um, who was uh, had a really good day, got this nice steelhead. And, uh, and then uh, Scott submitted this. Uh, these are both from tributaries. Uh, and this fish on the right there, he said it was about over 30 inches long. So that's a darn big steelhead <laughs> from anywhere. You can kind of see how far up the rod it, it goes there with his little measure, big uh, male. Um, then we got some snowbird pictures too. Uh, Brian Petrie sent us a couple of shots from Florida. Uh, and here's a redfish and then a speckled trout that he caught fly fishing. Um, the fellow on the right is, was the guide that he hired. And, uh, I believe they were on, the, they were on the East coast. I'm not sure what, uh, I believe I'm not sure what bodies of water, but they were, um, uh, probably Indian river area, I'm guessing. Uh, nice looking fish to catch on a fly though. Nice weather too. <laughs> and um, and here's, uh, we're starting to get action in our inland streams. Uh, Scott sent us that brown trout on the right. Didn't tell us where, but uh, a little smaller than the steelhead he had. And uh, also this uh, red-eyed smallmouth with, um, almost looks like a peacock bass with those markings on the, the head of it there. But uh, uh, we'll actually start to get good smallmouth in the uh, tributaries, usually early May or so, the uh, steelhead and the big browns go back in the lake when you know, we'll actually get a, start to get a pre-spawning run of uh, big smallmouth bass in our local tributaries. So that's something to look forward to. And then sometimes when you're fishing for trout, you catch something else. So, <laughs> so April is for suckers, I like to say, and you, you get the... Uh, huge uh, schools of these in some of our streams. I remember once, the first time I fished in Awatka, I didn't catch a trout and the only thing I could catch were these guys. And there was an enormous school of them going in between my feet and everywhere else, but uh, they're, uh, they, get, they get big enough, like the one Tyler has on the right there. They, they'll give you a little fight there, so. <laughs> Freshwater bonefish. And um, so welcome, especially the folks that are, made our meeting for the first time. Always um, good to have new people. And uh, just a little uh, technology update on our Facebook group. We're up to 313 people in the group. Uh, so if you have a good uh, fishing photo you want to share, that's a good spot to put it. And uh, usually I go onto Facebook to harvest uh, photos for our newsletter and, um, and for this meeting. And uh, we also post our uh, newsletter. We send it by email and um, also put it on Facebook. And now Orvis is actually uh, uh, putting links to our meetings on their um, email distribution. So we're starting to get the word out in all these venues. 
And so share the group if you, uh, any of your fishing friends, uh, it's a public Facebook group. So it's uh, not as uh, private as some of those are. And uh, one new thing we've done, we started a YouTube channel uh, oh, about a month ago. We um, debuted that and um, we're recording our meetings. We're recording this meeting as we talk. And uh, once uh, we're done with the meeting, uh, we uh, put the recording out on YouTube. So we have our, uh, uh, let's see, March and February meetings on YouTube. I wasn't too swift with starting the recording, so they started a few minutes into it, but tonight I got it started right on time. So take a look at it and uh, please hit the subscribe button. I, we get brownie points the more subscribers we get. I also put the uh, films that we did in December the, with the one with Ted Williams and uh, Lee Wolf. Uh, though they're stored out there. So anytime we get an a interesting video, um, uh, one that's on YouTube, we'll share. We have all our, um, a lot of fly patterns, uh, videos of how to tie various flies, including the ones in our fly fish and fly tying school. Uh, we've put all of those out on YouTube. So take a look at it. Uh, we're, um, there's actually one not uh, too hard to set up. Um, and then our future meetings, um, we're going to, uh, in May, May 17th, uh, our next meeting, we're going to do a, a profile of the Cahocton River, which is our home river in our territory. And um, Lisa, do you have an update on um, if that's officially, those uh, zip codes have been assigned to us or? Yes, yeah, so that uh, last list I sent, that is, uh, that is official. Uh, they should have already done the work to get those reassigned. Okay, great. So our yep. um, so that's good news. So the uh, down to uh, Bath, basically the Cohocton flows south into the Shemong River. It's actually part of the Susquehanna system, and, uh, and is um, officially in our TU territory. So that's a, a big deal. So we're going to um, profile the Cohocton um, and go over some of the conservation projects we do there, and uh, where to fish, and where to park, and Pretty, pretty accessible. Uh, there's a couple of major highways that run through the Cohocton Valley and uh, pretty much any time you get a bridge that crosses the river, that's a good place to park. That's a, and then uh, in June uh, 21st, we'll, uh, we'll get uh, together again. Uh, we're gonna have a picnic in Ontario County Park in uh, Bristol. A uh, beautiful park. It's one of the highest points in Ontario County with some really nice scenic views. And mm -hmm. we'll have a picnic there and then uh, also be able to fish a little bit. There's a pond in the park that's, uh, so maybe we'll have a little uh, friendly competition of how many sunfish we can catch out of the pond there. And then speaking of sunfish, um, I'm going to, uh, hopefully on July 19th, uh, there's a park in uh, Bloomfield. I want to see if we're able to have a group event at, and so stay tuned on that. I'll give the details once, um, uh, if we'll, we're able to do that. But um, uh, summertime is a good time to uh, fish for bass and panfish in this area. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, do something in July. Usually we take the month off, but uh, you know, we'll kind of try and open up year round now. In August, we'll uh, plan for, we'll have a planning meeting. That won't be an official uh, meeting. We'll kind of figure out what we want to do in the upcoming season. And then our first meeting of, 20, of the 21-22 season will be September 20th. And uh, we all usually have a theme. Uh, someone will tell us how they spent their summer vacation. Uh, we've had people give uh, things on trips to Canada or uh, Will did it to, when he was in Montana. And uh, cross our fingers, let's hopefully we'll be back in person uh, in September. So do Zoom in May and then have a picnic in June and, and then um, hopefully back to normal in, by September. And then uh, as far as learning how to fly fish, we had, had wanted to do our own fly uh, fishing school, but had to uh, postpone it a year because of COVID. So I wanted to uh, give a plug for Orvis's uh, uh, fly fishing 101. Uh, they have a. Uh, uh, they're doing it virtually too. If you go onto Orvis's uh, website to the store section under Rochester, uh, you can learn how to sign up for this. And it's a series of five uh, videos on some of the basics of fly fishing. And then they'll um, um, 
also afterwards you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one visit uh, with the uh, staff at the store and they'll uh, probably take you in the back of the store. There's kind of a grassy area in back of Pittsburgh Plaza there and they'll do some casting or help you out with knots or, or various things like that. So I want to give a shout out to our, our big supporter, Orvis. Um, and one thing I say about their graphic, I don't know who did this, but this is a good illustration of how not to fly fish because whoever's back casting uh, to nine o'clock there, you're not going to get a good loop <laughs> if you take your rod that far back there. Uh, so um, that'd be some of the things hopefully they'll teach you there. Usually ideally you want to do it from about uh, one or so to one or two o'clock. You don't want to go that far back there. <laughs> so. Okay, I just got dinged that Will has joined the, the meeting. And um, this is on my uh, monthly plea for volunteers. Uh, anything, um, any contributions to our newsletter, any stories or uh, interesting website links or especially photos, any stuff like that, just uh, uh, send us an update and, um, and then some of the other things, uh, we actually are doing pretty good in our social media and website area. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and, um, and Al will talk about conservation. And uh, now that Will's on, he'll give us a project <coughs> healing waters update. And uh, just shoot me an email, president at Canadagua Lake TU, uh, for any uh, volunteer um, things you want to take advantage of. <coughs> Uh, okay, and our, our website, hopefully by our next meeting, we'll actually be able to uh, have this online. Uh, it's actually making very good progress. This is a uh, look at the homepage of the new site. Um, and that project's being led by John Shaldone and Chris Pollock. Uh, and Chris is the, who also recently did the Seth Green TU site. So he's pretty uh, uh, well-versed in it. And, um, and we're doing pretty good. We have a, uh, the first uh, sections we'll have will be um, include a new conservation section, and uh, we also want to make it easy to contact us and also to donate to TU, so specifically to our chapter, which will be uh, a new thing for us there. So um, hopefully we'll, uh, like I said, do a rollout of that uh, by the May meeting. And Al, you're up now. I'll be quiet a bit there and talk about about our um, conservation programs. Yeah, yeah, you're pretty long-winded today. Yeah, <laughs> trying to fill the space before we get more people signed in. <laughs> so. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, since we uh, got some new folks on the line who usually don't tune in on the Canandaigua chapter, uh, first thing I'll do is talk a little bit about the picture on the right hand of that, that slide. Uh, Several years ago, we held a big, uh, organized a big cleanup project down at the Cochran River and we collected over 12 tons of trash. And we had like uh, 14 <coughs> places that we selected to pile the trash up. So this is only one of 14 of our places where we piled up the trash. So like I said, we collected over 12 tons of trash. We kind of I did this project in partnership with uh, <coughs> the uh, village of Cahocton and the uh, village of the town of Atlanta. And uh, so it was a really good project. <coughs> we got two projects ongoing right now this year. One is the Fair Brothers project. So basically what we're doing there is uh, planting more trees along the Cahocton River. One of the things we've really been trying to do uh, really kind of the last 10 years is to plant lots of trees along the Cochran River. Uh, the primary reason we want to do this is to <coughs> shade the river and help try to cool the water down. We're, um, I think it's got a lot to do with uh, climate change, but in the summertime, when we hit those peak uh, weeks of summer, the water just gets way too warm for good uh maintaining a trout population. So we have both the native brook trout and they're particularly uh, hurt by the warm water. And then we have the, uh, we got both wild browns and uh, stock browns. So 
the water gets way too much too warm in the summer so we're trying to do everything we can to um, plant trees along the river shade the river and drive that temperature down a little bit so um, on one may saturday one may we're going to be planting another 120 trees along a section of the river and i've got Got some volunteers, but I was hoping uh, there'd be enough people on the meeting tonight. Maybe I could get uh, one more volunteer. If anybody uh, wants to chime in and help uh, one May, Saturday, we're going to be meeting uh, 9 o'clock down by um, North Cahocton. If anybody else wants to volunteer, uh, let me know. The other big project we got going on, which is um, quite a bit larger, is our cross road project. And we uh, put an application in for Embrace the Stream program, and uh, we got awarded a grant. Uh, so we're, we've got the money we need to do the cross road project. In this project, we're actually building uh, nine pretty good size uh, habitat improvement structures in a section of the Cahocton River um, to create holding areas, provide protection, help improve oxygen content, and also help shade the river. So we're putting in these nine habitat improvement structures, and then we're going to be planting trees within a project area again to try to shade the river. So we're moving forward on that. We've We've cut down the nine big trees we need. We've, we've trimmed the trees. Um, we've got the site marked up. We actually plan to construct the uh, structures in July. We had to pick a time period when the water is as low as possible so we can put these structures in, get them exactly the way we want them, and have it relatively uh, safe out there. So that's a great project. Uh, we're going to uh, try to place the structures in July, and then we I'm looking at planting the trees next year in May because I like to use rootstock, and uh, July be too late in the season to try to get any rootstock and plant rootstock. So we're going to do that in 2022. And then the next bullet, again, I talked about the May 1st, go out there and plant a plant a bunch of trees and Gordon's already talked about uh, one of the things I wanted to get on the old website was a conservation uh, section which specifically talked about what we've done in the past on conservation and what we're doing in the future uh, and I drafted up uh, a section for that but, but instead of putting it on the old website um, Gordon's leading an effort to put it on the new website so so a lot of things going on in the conservation area, and uh, I just uh, ask that people try to help when they can, because uh, the only way we can keep doing this good stuff is if we get volunteers to help. So, so that's all I got. Anybody got any questions on what we're doing conservation right now? Okay, Gordon, you got it. Okay, thanks a lot, Al. Okay, uh, Will, is there any um, update on Project Healing Waters? Always. He went to the fridge to get a beer. There he is. <laughs> so, I see him. <laughs> He's here. Gone close, getting closer. There he is. <laughs> Got his hat on, must be getting, getting ready to go fishing. I, I actually have the best excuse of all is that I just got back from the Cohocton fishing uh, all day long see, see, see. With, with this guy right here, Jimmy Drone, so and Max Hillring. So we had a good day. Um, Project Healing Waters, they're very, uh, they're starting out very slowly, uh, having certain um, chap, uh, certain uh, chapters or units or whatever we're called. Um, taking people out, uh, maintaining social distancing. They're sort of experimenting and seeing how, uh, how we can um, do this safely and abide by all the CDC regulations and so on. So uh, it's still uh, 
the, everything's still on hold in our area. Um, we, we may uh, dip our toe in the water in terms of getting uh, one veteran and, and one person going out fishing, driving separately and so on, just to get people involved. Um, but that's still being worked on. And uh, John and Max and I talk quite frequently, but it's, uh, you know, you can't, we're, we're not allowed to do a lot of things that we'd like to do. So uh, it's more or less status quo right now. Okay. <clears throat> What is the June picnic looking uh, uh, unlikely or what, what do you think? I, I would say it looks unlikely um, just because so much of that is uh, beyond our control. Yeah. Um, but we, uh, Max and John and I have got a conference calls that we're scheduling relatively quickly and we've got to make a final decision on that. Um, we're going to, so I expect by the May meeting that we'll have a pretty good idea whether that's a go or not. My uh, gut feeling is it will be a no-go, but uh, that's still up in the air. Okay. All right, we'll cross our fingers then. Yep, there's not much we can do about it. It's all beyond our control. Yep. And speaking of Jim, that's a, he's the cover boy here with the uh, veteran. <laughs> right. The, the, the fish we caught today were not much bigger than that. Fish, so <laughs> if it makes anyone feel any better. Do you, do you see any risers, Will? We did. We did. Uh, right around, Max told us, he said, two o'clock in the afternoon, we'll see risers. And sure enough, we did. And that's where we ca caught the majority of fish on Hendrickson Drys. So that was my first dry fly of the year, a nice 14 inch or so. Sounds good. It was, uh, it was a good day. And of course, we hadn't seen each other all in a while, so that was a lot of fun as well. Since the two of them both had COVID and have been fully vaccinated, and I've been fully vaccinated, so we're uh, we're ready to get back out and become people again. Yeah, that's great news. Especially that they're feeling well better too, and we were yeah. it shows how yeah. close it, to home it, this it, thing can hit. <laughs> Oh yeah, they're, they're, they both are lingering uh, effects, you know, and you can tell like when you're climbing up a hill to get to the road or something, they both have to stop and sit on the guardrail for a minute or two to catch their breath. And I'm probably the most disabled one of the three and I cruise right past them. So, you know, you're hurting when I can do that. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're uh, ready for the first part of our, our program. Let me stop my share. And uh, actually, let me introduce uh, Lisa Green. She's our, uh, uh, let's see, Region 7 Vice President. for Region 8. Region, region 8, right, Region 7 is east of us. So um, thank you, Lisa, and uh, let me give you the floor. All right, fantastic. Well, thanks for um, letting me join you today. And I'll just get my screen up here. And I'll start with a, a quiz. Does anybody know where this, uh, where this pool is right here? I think some of you guys should know where that is. So this is the- uh, Upper fly, isn't it? The, hey, who got that? It's Lisa Abel. <laughs> That's paradise. <school. laughs> All right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's the upper fly zone on the Salmon River Paradise Pool. So, um, so one of my favorite favorite places, just because it's so beautiful there. Um, even if I don't catch a fish, I'm always happy to be there. Uh, so, my name is Lisa Green. I'm uh, I'm your state representative uh, on TU Council. I started that position about um, well, kind of end of last year. And uh, I want to talk a little bit tonight about uh, how do we diversify TU, how do we diversify, um, you know, from a chapter perspective and from a national perspective, and really just supposed to be some food for thought um, and to start a discussion. So as we talk through this, I'd just like everybody to think about, you know, what can, what can I do to help in this initiative? What can our chapter do? What can TU National or TU State do to help us uh, be, become more diversified. 
So a little bit about me. This is a graphical representation of my life. So um, I was born in Alabama. Uh, technically, I was born across the state line in Mississippi, which my family likes to give me a hard time about. But I was born uh, in uh, lower Alabama. And I grew up fishing on the rivers with my dad. And that's a real uh, uh, way that I sparked my passion for fishing. So that was I was a daddy's girl, and we had a lot of great, great quality time, bass fishing, crappie fishing, cane poles, spinning rods, all that kind of good stuff. Never picked up a fly rod until I moved to Rochester. So around the turn of the century, I know that sounds like a long time ago, but uh, around 2000, I moved to Rochester um, and saw some people fly fishing, saw the movie A River Runs Through It, and started to think, hmm, what is, what is that? What's going on there? And then a real obsession began. Uh, and for me, it's been a really great uh, way that I've met a lot of great people. But I, most importantly for me, it's been a way that I've been able to find some peace and uh, stress release in my life. Uh, I love it. I love all the time I can spend on the water. Uh, a few years back, I started interacting a lot with the Seth Green chapter of Trout Unlimited, of which you're all familiar, I'm sure. And uh, I was the secretary on the board for that and also the treasurer for several years uh, before becoming the, um, the, the vice president for, for the region here. And uh, the bottom of the screen here is kind of my, I call this one of my crazy fish faces. So uh, whenever I, I'm very happy about a fish that I catch, which is pretty much any time I catch a fish and somebody captures that moment uh, on a camera, I'm always, really kind of got my big crazy eyes going and excited because uh because that's my happy place so let's uh we got darwin here and he's got this quote and i would say if we boil this down to one statement it would be evolve or die and it's true of species it's true of organizations it's true of businesses and uh and it's absolutely true of trout unlimited so as we think about Trout Unlimited and why we should seek to be more, more diverse as a chapter and as an organization. Um, I could talk to you for a long time about how it's the right thing to do and we should all try to do that. Um, it, but when we got down to brass tacks, it'd be, we've got to do this to continue to survive as an organization. And when we talk about diversity, uh, you know, we're talking about definitely getting more women involved, getting more people of color involved, uh, different age groups involved, I think, is, is a big initiative uh, for us. And just diversity of thought and background. You know, all these things really contribute to a stronger chapter and a more uh, viable chapter as we move forward. And I thought some of these were, were interesting. So this is from the uh, TU Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Initiative uh, website. And uh, the three main goals of that are a more, a more diverse membership profile, a more diverse leadership profile, and a welcoming and inclusive culture at every level of TU. And so I think that, you know, just by, you know, inviting the conversation and saying, hey, we're going to have a special event where we're going to try to include more women. It's a sign that this chapter is interested in being more diverse. And I think that's always a great place to, to you know, start that conversation to say, hey, how, how can we do this? Let's have a conversation about it. Let's engage some people. And let's just put the message out there that we're open um, to, to having these conversations. A great statistic here, 31% uh, of fly fishing participants are women. And I, that surprised me because I certainly don't see that when I'm out on the stream. But if you go to places like Montana, uh, you know, more that those those Western streams and any of you guys who've been good gals who've traveled out there, uh, you do see more women fly fishing out uh, in those areas. So while 31% of people who fly fish are women, only 6% of TU are female. So, you know, I, I think it's a food for thought. Why is that? Why don't we have more women engaged? Um, and, and we need the strength and viewpoints of a diverse group, you know, all those different diverse groups that I talked about. Um, and let's think about, for each of us, how do we engage more women? How do we engage more people of color, youth, families, uh, all of those things that can make us a better and stronger organization? 
And until we do that, until we can represent a stronger, you know, broader group of stakeholders uh, and bring them to the table, our solutions will be incomplete. So we really need to bring all those things to the table to have a good solution. So uh, this is my uh, what women want are the special interests of women in, in TU and fly fishing. I certainly don't claim to speak for all women. Uh, this is just some of the things, some of the thoughts that have occurred to me in having many conversations with women around fly fishing, around becoming involved in organizations like Trout Unlimited, um, and in really thinking about what are some common themes that I see. And I think it's a way to identify those things, start to address those things, and, um, and say, hey, how do, we, how do we make it a little better? So uh, you can see, uh, you can see my, my pal Lisa Abel here. So she's uh, in this, in this just a group of us just getting together for some fishing. Good day. So safety. So what, is a, what does a motorcycle have to do with, with fly fishing and uh, safety? So uh, many years ago, I decided I wanted to learn how to ride a motorcycle. Uh, I went out and, and bought a, a, a 1992 Maxim 650 Yamaha with, uh, with a drag seat on it and a Harley peanut tank. And, uh, and I was ready to ride, but I wasn't ready to ride until I felt like I could do that safely. And so I signed up for a course over at Monroe Community College. And uh, I walked into that room fully expecting to be the only woman there. And much to my surprise, the room was filled with women. So when I talked to the instructor about that, the instructor said, yeah, actually the majority of people who take this class are women because women are very interested in being safe in this activity. They wanna make sure they're wearing the proper gear, that they know the proper techniques. So, um, you know, I think this is a theme with, with women that when they do things, they want to do them in a way that's uh, safe for them. You know, waiting safety is a big topic. Um, I think that they, you know, definitely are thinking about predators. And so whether those predators are, you know, animals or hostile people on the stream, it's definitely a concern. And it's one of those things that I think um, if you've, if you've only only lived your life as a man, you might not understand some of the uh, safety concerns that women have, the awareness that we feel like we need to have as we move through the world. And so, you know, it's, there's some of those moments where um, I've had a guy kind of um, come up stealthily at me in the woods and, you know, it's, it startled me. And, and of course, he didn't mean to, you know, he didn't know that that was going to startle me. He does, he's not thinking about that sort of predator instinct the same way that I might be thinking about it. So it's just things to think about um, as, you know, women, they, they want to be safe. They want to feel like they can be in this environment and, uh, and not have to worry. Community is a big thing uh, with women in fly fishing. And I think this is something that can bring a lot of women in, um, is that sense of community, friendships. Um, did I mention safety? Uh, you know, it, fishing with, going fishing with a buddy, having other people that you can meet up with and go fishing, and just help getting started. So uh, this picture here, the one with the group of women. So uh, Lindsay Agnes has done many uh, fly fishing schools for women on the Salmon River. and um, it's really been popular. Anytime she's run that class, there's been, uh, you know, more people signed up than, than she could take in the class, actually. And uh, would love to see uh, Canandaigua give a shot at a women's uh, session at some point, and I'd be willing to help. Um, but the interesting thing about that is we would see people repeat the class. And um, I think that's, you know, people would really enjoy the class have that sense of community, but they wouldn't quite have the confidence yet to go out on the water for themselves. So then when it would roll around again the next year, they'd say, oh, here's an opportunity for me to get a little bit more experience. So I think, you know, again, women want to um, have a little help getting started. Education. I, so I think these things all tie in, right? So, um, you know, I think that, uh, not to overgeneralize, but I think that uh, as, a, as a general rule, a lot more men know about knots than women do. So uh, funny enough, I think this whole thing about knots tends to trip women up. So 
if you're trying to help um, a woman get into fly fishing, or if you are a woman wanting to get into fly fishing, um, let's get it down to a couple of simple knots. The knot to tie your fly on, the knot to tie your um, more tip it to your leader, and then you know how to do a loop to loop connection. So keeping things simple, I think it's really important um, in, in these cases. Um, and having some basic outdoor skills. And another thing, a common theme I'm seeing is, you know, as I try to help other women learn how to fly fish is just kind of a sense of perfectionism and feeling like if you don't have that perfect cast, then the trout's not gonna eat your fly. Um, and, and we all know that's not true. We've had plenty of sloppy casts before that uh, still caught a fish. And if anybody has any, any questions or thoughts or comments, feel free to, you know, chime in or chat those in or, or whatnot, and, uh, and we can talk about that. So here's another uh, interesting thing I think we can advocate for. So uh, the logistics issues that, that women in particular can face, uh, how to find the time, how to arrange for childcare to be able to get time away to go out and fish, finding the places to fish, and an outhouse. <laughs> um, so you know, for me, I don't mind going in the woods, that's fine, but sometimes these streams are really crowded. You've got a lot of people there. There's not really a, a private spot to go in the woods. So I'm always happy when I see that um, some of these uh, more more public um, crowded places do are starting to have more of these uh, portageons available for, for use. And I think um, we can all advocate for a little bit more of that from our DEC partners. And then culture. And, uh, you know, my disclaimer about this, uh, you know, how do we create a welcoming environment, uh, not condescending, having language awareness, um, how we speak, you know, especially in, in chapter meetings and social events. Um, I will say for every one negative uh, encounter I've had, I've had hundreds of really positive encounters. So most of the time when I encounter other fly fishing folks on the, on the stream and stores, whatever, I feel like they're almost going above and beyond to be nice. Hey, this is the fly I'm using. Hey, this is the, you know, the, my favorite spot on the stream. Let me tell you about it. Um, but, you know, I think that it is an awareness that sometimes in, in fly fishing, there can be a very uh, male dominated type of culture. There can be a, uh, some hostility from, from certain people. Um, I had a, one of my first times I went, I was looking for fly fishing, fly tying materials, and I went to Gander Mountain, and I was going around, I couldn't find what I wanted, and uh, back in the day, and even more so now, I guess, Gander Mountain uh, didn't have a lot of material, so I couldn't find what I was looking for. So I stopped the sales, the sales guy, and I said, hey, can you, uh, can you tell me where to find this fly tying material? He said, well, we don't have that. And I said, well, do you know of a substitute? And he said, well, what fly is your husband trying to tie? <laughs> and, and I just, I just kind of was, didn't know what to say to that. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it, it's just kind of that uh, making assumptions about other people and, and what they're doing. But, you know, I think that overall, fly fishing people are great people and have a great culture and are very welcoming. And uh, when we think about diversifying the chapter as well, um, it, one of the things that I think really pulls uh, women into the sport of fly fishing and into conservation type work is nature. Um, the peace that we get from it, the escape from stress, the slower pace, and the beauty of it. And uh, I'm sure all of you experience that as well. Um, there is, there's a, an RIT professor uh, named Pat Scanlon, who's in our fly fishing community. Some of you might have met Pat. He's, uh, he's been working on a manuscript to write about the therapeutic powers of fly fishing. And he's uh, talked to casting for recovery participants as well as Project Healing Water participants. And um, he's been doing some background research overall in the, the overall healing power of nature. So there's been a lot of studies about uh, being outdoors, and how that helps with your stress levels, of course, but also your your brain waves and your uh, your ability to think clearly. Um, and I think that you know 
I'm, I'm excited. I hope Pat finds a good publisher for his book because I think it's a great point, something a lot of us experience as we are out there in the water enjoying it is just um, how you can really forget about everything else, let everything else go and focus on everything else or focus on nothing but um, what fly you're going to present, how you're going to present it, where is that trout? I would like to you know, bring up the idea that you don't have to be a fly fishing person to be a part of TU. And I think that's a way that we could also diversify our membership and diversify our leadership is by thinking about some other people who are interested in conservation. Maybe they're really interested in the stream planting and stream cleanup type activities. Um, you know, and making sure that we, how do we draw other people in who might not be members of the fly fishing community, but who might be spin fishing people or who might be conservation hiking people. So I'm going to uh, put up here, I have a couple of resources for women. So uh, we have several Facebook groups that are out there, uh, New York Women of Trout Unlimited, the overall National Women of Trout Unlimited. And there's also another great group, a very active group called United Women on the Fly, women from out all over the world who are connected on Facebook. Um, and if people want to get together, have recommendation for a guide or looking for people in a certain area to fish, it's a great way to connect. Um, and then supporting women-owned businesses. So uh, there's some women guides that I know personally, uh, Rachel Finn, Kiki Galvin, Anita Colton, and Alice Owsley. So, um, Rachel, a lot of people probably know her. She guides up on the off table. Kiki's kind of in the DC area. Anita Colton's on the Delaware. Alice Alsby's out in West Yellowstone. Um, there's some interesting women owned businesses that have been started around uh, women's fishing apparel. So there's Miss Mayfly, who uh, does custom uh, waders for women. And then Fishy Wear, uh, it's really neat. Prints and uh, there, some of their clothing has been carried in Orvis, and then uh, we have you know Orvis, which has their 50/50 on the water initiative. So, um, anybody else want to give a shout out to um, any particular resources, any women-owned businesses, any guides? Uh, anybody have any that they want to just unmute and say, or want to put in the chat? I'll pause a minute here. Um, yeah, I have some really fun leggings that I got. It's not woman-owned, but the company is Fincognito. And they make some really sweet leggings. There's a brown trout pattern that's really adorable, and they're perfect underweighters. Um, there's a brook trout one, and I got the tarpon also. Like, you got to watch for a sale, though. Um, All right. There's another company called Yellow Sally. And the, the quality is not quite there yet, but their graphics are really cute. So I'm torn there. That's my. All right. Cool. Things. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to chime in with one? Yeah, I just uh, one of the suggestions I always go back to is the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. I don't know the status of the Girl Scouts. I know they're kind of mixed up right now with the Boy Scouts and I'm not sure what's happening. But at least an overture to Girl Scouts, young people uh, in Scouts and, and other activities, uh, particularly women, might be well might be a well placed uh, uh, you know kind of uh, invitation for people to fish. Yeah, I, I love that, and um, I, I think it it. it, it it captures two things we need to do, right? It's more, more women involved and also more youth involved because uh, we need to be looking for those young people to bring into our chapter. You know, Boy Scouts too is a great idea. How do we get those young people engaged and interested in conservation, uh, however we can get them in and helping us uh, work on our cause. So great one. As far yeah. as a, a guides, um, I, fish with uh, years ago I went on vacation on the Outer Banks of North Carolina and uh, for saltwater fishing there's a husband and wife team uh, they call themselves I think it's uh, Outer Banks Fly Fishing and Brian and Sarah Horsley and uh, Sarah used to call herself Fly Girl 
I remember, but uh, I... both of them, uh, they've been um, around for a long time. Very good. But if you want to do some saltwater uh, fishing in a beautiful area, um, uh, look them up. Yeah, sounds fun. I was just going to say that um, where I see a, a need is uh, I had a friend um, ask me about her son was interested in getting started fishing, but they weren't a fishing family. And so they had no expertise and they um, they just didn't even know where to get, how to get started. And, you know, I looked around a lot and looked around a lot. And, you know, aside from kind of, you know, pushing them toward Orvis or um, maybe just to start coming to, to you, but that just, it didn't seem to quite fit what they were looking for, you know? And, and um, uh, the question is like, if you're not even sure that they're gonna like it, how big of an investment do you wanna make up front? Um, so I do think, and, and he's not a Boy Scout, so I don't know, but, but it just felt like, oh, gosh, I wish I could advise them better, you know? Yeah, uh, Gordon, maybe talk about the uh, fly fishing clinic that you guys are, are hoping to have here uh, whenever we're less restricted. Yeah, no, we, um, well, it was about five or six years ago, the last time we did it, but we did actually, I'm guessing maybe a third of the class were women. And um, one of the uh, things is uh, we provided all the equipment because uh, nice. the price of admission can be um, steep. Fly rods, for some reason, are more expensive than spinning rods, even though they're made out of about the same stuff. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so we we provided all the rods, and uh, and uh, our members were you know doing kind of one on one uh, casting help. So uh, you know something where you can learn and you don't have to necessarily buy the equipment is um, and actually guided trips. If you do hire a guide, they will almost always you know provide yeah. you all the equipment you need. So um, um, you won't necessarily have to, you know, go spend a thousand dollars on uh, fly rods and waders and all the other stuff. So uh, I love that you had a couple of uh, more low key events planned. So like your picnic and the bass and panfish uh, activity that you had. So you know, probably if uh, you had some newbies show up, I'm sure there'd be more than enough people willing to give them a hand getting started too. Mm -hmm. Well, I always recommend anyone wanting to, to uh, learn how to fly fish, uh, find a pond with bass and panfish in it because they're very uh, mm -hmm. aggressive fish. They're fun to catch and, and um, they, they can really teach you a lot. So, um, uh, you know, don't necessarily start in the, you know, stream fishing where you have to buy waders and things like that. All you have to do to get started is uh, find a pond with uh, some willing sunfish in it. Yeah, absolutely. So Lisa, um, I let's gonna, talk. Yeah, I was Go ahead, Lisa. Say, I know that um, for the Mohawk Valley TU group that they have fly rods, and you know, if you have anybody who's interested, like Ann was saying, like the kids, they they have you know some events just like Canandaigua does, um, where they you know the, the, if the kids want to learn, you know, they've got the right people there to teach them, but they also have the equipment, uh, and a lot of the TU units do have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I did want to bring some resources for everyone uh, because I think that is part of that is, is getting more people who are who are at that beginning level. How do they get uh, more comfortable? Gordon actually had a really nice slide about the Orvis Learning Center. Um, they're doing their virtual classes now. They have uh, the, the free classes in person, which are really great. I've, I've actually helped teach those before, and they're really a, a nice uh, dip your toe in. Um, and, and they'll probably bring those back once we're, we're past COVID, um, the 101, 201, 301 kind of building skills for people. But they have a really nice uh, learning center there. Um, and for me, you know, kind of the where to fish. So there's the public fishing rights map. Uh, there's a, a, new, a new map that's out there that's a more interactive map, the DEC info locator map. Um, and plenty of stocking information. And what I'm gonna do is I've got some websites that I'm gonna paste into the chat here. I was gonna, uh, we're, I don't wanna run too late on time. So I'm just gonna give you some links. If anybody wants some good links, um, there they are. And what I would just say, there's one thing I've noticed. So if you look at the DEC uh, public fishing rights maps, 
and you kind of can click on, they've got a map there and you can click on region eight, for example. And um, some of these maps no longer have the PDF link. So if I look at, you know, Livingston County and I see the Cohocton River, there's no map there. Um, so what you can do with a lot of these streams and, um, and OAC has got the same thing. But if I do a Google search and I type in the word Cohocton PFR for public fishing rights, it'll pop up the PFR map for you. Um, and, and they're really great maps. So um, it'll give you an overview of the fishery. Um, it'll tell you what type of species you might find there and the general location. And, um, and then you have these maps and you can kind of drill down for each of these areas. You can uh, go down to the next level and kind of see, oh, okay, this, this area, um, it, it gives these shaded areas of where there's actually public access to fishing, uh, where there's parking areas. You can kind of see these, these arrows indicate the flow of the water. So you can see the, the flow of the stream here. So I find these really um, a fun time. On, on a weekend, you know, I'll download a map and I'll say, let me see if I can go find this. Now, the problem I have with some of these fishing, public fishing rights maps is they're a little bit um, non-specific on some of the roads. So some of the road names are there, but it's sometimes hard to tell what town. And I'm the kind of person who's like punching things into my, you know, my Waze app on my phone. So sometimes these are a little bit hard. You kind of have to find the nearest town name, find a street name, punch it in, and then go from there. But now DEC, I'll show you real quick. DEC has this new map. Um, it does have the, you know, you can drill down, you can zoom in on the map and, um, and find some different things. But um, what you do, and I, I gave you the link for that, but what you can do is over here on the left-hand side, you can scroll on this layer information and I did not bring my reading glasses down here. But what you're looking for is... I just see your PowerPoint, Lisa. You might have to stop oh. that. And oh, your... oh boy. Oh, so nobody just saw the public fishing rights map that I was showing you either. <laughs> Darn it. Oh, it's such a rookie mistake, you guys. <laughs> All right. Let's try this. All right. so. Okay, so here's what I was talking about with the public fishing rights maps, how they're, um, they're listed by county, right? But you don't see a PDF actually for a link for Cohocton or for OACA. So that's where you might want to Google search that. And then here's my sample of a public fishing rights map. You can actually the there's a areas. search within the DEC site. Um, okay. Uh, so if you type like Cohocton River in the, in that, that'll pop up. Um, yeah, that whole series of maps. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, yeah. So I find these I find these super helpful just to kind of find some different areas to explore and fish. Um, so if anybody doesn't know yet about the PFR maps, they're pretty cool. And then this is the new site. So this is the new interactive map that the DEC has been working on. Um, the desktop version right now is working better than the um, better than the phone version. So they said they're working on a new mobile version. So I would recommend looking at this on your home computer. Here we go. So if we change this over to outdoor activity here, and then we're going to look for water activities. Mm. Yeah water-related activities down here. And then you can see their new um, categories for the different trout streams. You're gonna have them shaded here. So you can choose the layers and you'll start to see those appear. So the different um, colors that they have for the different streams. And then you can kind of zoom in here. I did think this was kind of cool. So, if 
It's going to show you the parking areas. And then you can see it's starting to draw in OACA down here. So what it'll show is when there's additional regulations for an area. And so here's OACA Creek and it's telling you that this um, special section, the this is the park section here that it's talking about and that it's catch and release only, artificial lures only. So I think this is gonna be um, a really nice resource. I think they're still working on it. still needs a little bit of work, still a little bit quirky but um, might be something you wanna um, get out there and check out. All right. And let me just go back to my PowerPoint for, oh, one slide. So, um, so the thought I just wanted to end with was take a girl fishing. So this is, uh, some of you might know Jesse Hollenbeck. He's the president of the Seth Green chapter. This is his daughter, Emma. And uh, he's been taking her fishing since uh, she was little bitty. And if you'll remember, I kind of started talking about this by saying that, um, you know, part of my passion and love for fly fishing and, and for the outdoors started with my dad taking me fishing. So, um, you know, I think it's a really great opportunity for you to bond with your kid, your grandkids, your, your niece, your, you know, your friend's daughter. Um, just, you know, let's get girls out there and involved in fishing and, um, and help them be a part of that, too, because the outdoors is a, is a great place to be. So thanks, everybody. Any, any questions or comments before I wrap up? That trout so, is about as big as she is. <laughs> yeah. So what That's is your out. feel, Lisa, what's your feel really for uh, people out there really interested in, in getting into fishing? For example, we, we advertise, you know, we're doing these things and we invite anybody who wants to join us and, and the new people coming out is, very slim to say the least uh you know like our yeah. conservation projects you know i put often i put those in the local paper and i i say you want to participate and help with conservation you know send me an email you know you know how many emails i get not a whole lot yeah. of emails so um it seems to me a lot of people are turning inward not outward and you know just what are you finding out from your your experience, you know, for example, that figure of 31% of women, yeah. uh, fly fishermen and women, boy, I would, I would argue that up and down, uh, not here in the Northeast, I don't think. I, I do quite a bit of fishing. And I can tell you how many yeah. women I run into on the fishing stream. Uh, not a whole yeah. lot. Uh, so. I don't think it's, I don't think the numbers are, are the same here. I, I think it's more out west. I think it's when you combine out west. I think there's a, quite a bit of women who fish in Texas. But I think, you know, it, as far as your question about, you know, how to get the word out, I think it's a matter of channel. And, and we used to be able to, you know, Lindsay's seminars, for example, they used to be advertised in the paper, and she'd get a lot of people from the paper. But I think now it's all about Facebook, Twitter, social media, and, and again, I think it's one of those, those ways we need to get more of those young people involved. Like how do we get some high school and college kids involved who really know, you know, what are the kids looking at these days? How do we get out, reach out to them? Cause I'm certainly not, you know, I, you know, <laughs> I'm not the best at, at social media, but I do see that, you know, for example, Facebook has very active social media presence for women. Um, so it, it's, I think, how do we, explore some of those other channels because I do think there are people who who want to be involved who are interested in outdoor activities and and I think even more so they're interested in connecting with other people um, sadly I think we live in a very lonely and isolated world and a lot of people are looking for some kind of connection and um, you know for me Trout Unlimited and in different fly fishing events that feels like my tribe when I'm walking in I feel at home I feel like I have something in common that I could talk to other people with. And I think there's, there's a lot of people who are really hungry for that. And, uh, and, 
you know, how do we reach out to those people and help them engage with us? Okay, well, well, I just want to say thank you for your presentation and all you do for TU. Thanks, Al. Thank you for all you do. You're the conservation <laughs> king. <laughs> so so I, I just wanted to point out, I, I fished out west and there are way more women fly fishers out west than there are around here, at least as far as I can tell. Um, yeah. But I, if you also looked at the demographics of TU membership, it's very heavily weighted to certain areas of the country, in particular the northeast. Mm -hmm. So you're comparing sort of apples and oranges when you say 31% of all people who fish are women, yet only 8% are TU members. That could very well be a discrepancy between where TU is represented in the United States versus the entire United States where 31% of the anglers are women. Um, yeah. but, but that's sort of an aside. I mean, that may explain that glaring discrepancy, but I think it's um, it's something that we need to do, and I think it's something we need to put some effort into. Um, I'll be honest with you, Lisa, you're talking to a bunch of guys who haven't got a clue. Uh, <laughs> men, men generally don't have a clue about what things <laughs> women want or what they understand anyway, uh, if I could generalize what most of my friends tell me. And I think this is really no different. So we really need some guidance and direction. <laughs> well, I appreciate the conversation. You know, I think that's always that's always a, a great place to start. And uh, and I think that uh, it's a good it's a good group of guys here. Um, and I would love to see more women involved in your chapter. And and however I can help you guys, I'm I'm all in for that for sure. All right, I'm going to leave. Make sure we have enough time for Lisa. So. Uh, and uh, Lisa knows another way we bring in a lot of women into the sport of fly fishing. So uh, why don't you tell them all about it, Lisa? Okay, thank you. It was a really nice presentation, Lisa. Yeah, thank you very much. Very nice, great. thank you. Okay, let me do a quick intro to our second speaker, uh, Lisa Abel, uh, who's the, I think, Outreach Coordinator is your title for Casting for Recovery. Uh, uh, which has uh, retreats. Um, well, you talk a little bit more about it. I know they're 25 years old. That's <laughs> and um, and have many um, activities around the country. Give me one second. Pull my PowerPoint up here. Okay. This is the uh, second meeting we've had Lisa at. So we're. So while you're pulling that up, uh, I just mentioned that uh, last year the chapter. I kind of organized an effort. We tied a whole bunch of flies for your retreat up in the Salmon River, which never, never happened. Uh, right. We we tied about 120 flies, and I think uh, I think at least three of my fly tires were women. So you got some you got some first quality products. And we still have those flies that we will use for this year's retreat <laughs> as well. Okay, can you guys see my PowerPoint? Damn it. Not yet. All right, hang on. Yeah, it should be okay on my end. It's me. Okay. <laughs> We did I wish this you guys night could... with no problems, and here I have technical yeah. difficulties. Okay, here we go, I think. I wish you all could see the looks on the, on the ladies' faces, though, when they open those fly boxes just packed with flies. They can hardly believe that those are all for them. So, nice, yeah, nice yeah, job. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay, I think I've got it, guys. There you, you go. Me? Okay. All right, thank you. So, as Gordon said, um, my name is Lisa Abel. I am the participant coordinator for the Upstate New York Casting for Recovery Retreat. Um, I'm also a breast cancer survivor and I became involved with Casting for Recovery back in 2017 when I attended the retreat myself as a participant. And uh, as a result of the uh, great experience that I had at the retreat, I decided I wanted to give back as a volunteer. So 
I like to talk about casting for recovery and, and get the word out about the program. And that's exactly what I'll do tonight. Um, talk, you know, about the organization a little bit itself, but more importantly about what happens at our upstate New York casting for recovery retreat. So CFR actually has been um, helping women for 25 years and really we help women from all walks of life. So the retreats are open to women who have had a breast cancer diagnosis, regardless of their age. Um, the program is appropriate for women in any stage of their treatment or recovery. And we focus on their wellness and empowerment of these women. And it's really an opportunity to bring them together. Um, many of these women are under the common bond of just having been diagnosed with breast cancer. So each of our retreats incorporates fly fishing instruction as long as, as well as emotional support. And then it's followed by a half day of guided catch and release fly fishing. And, you know, I, we're asked a lot of times why fly fishing and breast cancer and fly casting is considered to be a good means of physical therapy, um, increasing the mo mobility of the um, upper arm and the body, especially for women who have had, you know, surgery, whether it be a lumpectomy, mastectomy, um, and the radiation treatments as well. So it does help them with their mobility. A couple of facts about CFR, 70% uh, of the women who attend our retreats have never been to a support group. And this is really their first opportunity to be surrounded by a group of their peers. And then CFR offers 57 retreats across the country. We serve 700 women each year. And to date, we've served over 10,000 women. Uh, we rely on the support of 1,800 great volunteers nationwide. And that includes our medical and psychosocial professionals, fly fishing instructors, and alumni. Um, this is probably the best fact of all. 100% of the women who are surveyed after our retreat would recommend the program to others. So our upstate New York retreat is hosted at the Tailwater Lodge. Um, we make our home at the Tailwater for two and a half days. It's really a great venue. We are close to the river. We can walk right out back to fish. Um, great accommodations. The women really love it. So we host 14 women from the upstate western New York area. And as I stated, the retreat incorporates the fly instruction, emotional support, and then that fly fishing at the end of the two and a half days. So what happens at the retreat? Um, here's some fun pictures for everybody to look at. On day one, when the women arrive, they're greeted and one of our volunteers will help them off to the room to get settled and checked in. Uh, then they are kind of moved on to uh, meet our fly cast instructors and the rest of our staff where they get fitted for their waiters. And you can see here by our pictures that is a fun activity. It's really an icebreaker for all of these women who have, uh, you know, try on waiters will make everybody happy. So it, it's a great, great um, way to get to know each other. And then of course, you know, the, the days are followed by fly cast instruction on day two, uh, you know, they spend a lot of time outdoors on the grounds, learning how to um, tie their knots. Again, like uh, the fly casting as well. We do give the women some free time um, in between there. If they wanna learn how to tie flies, they can um, take a walk down by the river and even hang out by the fire pit is, is a great, um, you know, a great opportunity for them just to uh, get to know each other through some social time. And of course, you know, we do squeeze in the emotional support. Um, our, our medical professionals meet with the women as a group and talk through their concerns as a breast cancer survivor and um, help them navigate through um, those concerns that they may have. So what's new uh, with our upstate New York Casting for Recovery Retreat? I'm pretty excited. You can hear it in my voice and see the smile on my face but we're gonna have our retreat this year. So after the 2020 year, um, all of our retreats were canceled countrywide last year due to the, due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, so we're excited uh, to be moving forward and our retreat date is set for June 10th and 12th, or 10th through the 12th, I'm sorry. Um, our 2021 participants have been selected and notified. So I've been busy making phone calls out to the women to make sure that they've received their notifications and following up with the alternates. 
Um, we have some pretty enthusiastic anglers coming our way, I think. Uh, more importantly, these women are looking for a break and they're ready to attend this retreat. So we do have uh, pretty some strict COVID protocols in place in order to hold the retreat. That will include all of our participants, staff and volunteers needing to be fully vaccinated within two weeks prior to arriving um, at the tailwater for the retreat. And one of the changes we've also made this year is the, men, the women are typically um, buddied up so and share a room, but each of the participants this year will have their own single room, again, just to make them more comfortable um, coming out of such serious, serious circumstances with the pandemic. So this is a quote um, that actually one of our Casting for Recovery participants um, had shared in their feedback. And really, you can see here that it's really being expressed of as a life changing experience. Um, she's noted that she loves fishing and loves the new adventures that her life has in, in regards to casting for recovery and also just, you know, being more concerned about um, living now instead of the concerns that come with breast cancer, which includes the thought of death. So I've been, you know, I, I find that I'm, the, the impact I have when I speak to people is really based on my own personal circumstance. It's what I know the best. Uh, so I like to share a little bit of my background and how I feel that casting for recovery has actually changed my own life. So you'll see in the subsequent slides, um, some pictures, and these are all going to be from our Casting for Recovery retreats that we've had over the years, and I'm going to share a little bit about my own background and my breast cancer diagnosis. So I was diagnosed with breast cancer on July 19th of 2016, which happened to be my 49th birthday, and um, I pretty much knew uh, before I received the phone call what the doctors were going to tell me, and I had been ushered back and forth between specialists for a couple days and I could see the concern on their face, so I knew it was coming. So what I wasn't prepared for was that my diagnosis ended up being much more severe than what had been originally uh, communicated to me, and I found out after my surgery that I was, um, that my cancer had made it into my lymph nodes, and I was facing um, four months of chemo and about two months of radiation. So I spent basically the next you know, six to seven months of, uh, of my life um, going through and, you know, fighting for my life. But as well, um, I realized as I got close to my radiation treatments, I needed to find a way to put breast cancer behind me. So that's exactly what I started to do. I decided I wanted to get away and I wasn't quite sure what get away meant at that point. All I knew is I needed to kind of find a way to say, okay, I'm, I'm celebrating myself for, you know, making it through my chemo and my radiation. Uh, and I started Googling um, breast cancer retreats. And as I did, up came Casting for Recovery. And my, um, I was a little bit familiar with Casting for Recovery because I had seen a segment on NBC Nightly News just about a year prior to that, uh, where Lester Holt had been in Montana at one of the retreats. And I sat in my living room watching that, that, that broadcast that night and unbeknownst to me, you know, just a year later, I was going to receive my own breast cancer diagnosis. So I applied for the retreat that night and kept my fingers crossed that I would be picked. Um, and about a month later, I did receive notification by an email that I had been selected to, ascend, to attend the 2017 retreat. And I will tell you that I was more than excited at that point. It was what I really needed. Um, but I really didn't know at that point how much casting for recovery would actually change my life. So just like the other women, it was the first time I had been away from home since I, I had been diagnosed. Um, I was excited to be around uh, other women in similar circumstances, but more importantly, I was looking forward to fly fishing. I had always had a desire to fly fish, had never pursued it, uh, but this was my chance. And I got out there and um, they put a flyer out on my hand and I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. I can pull this off. So um, it became, you know, it was fun. But the, the, the turning point for me um, was the day that I actually went fishing with my river helper. And, you know, there's a lot of excitement after, you know, you're, you're taught all the knots and different things. But when you go headed for that water, you know, you're putting to test um, all of the things that 
our instructors have taught. So I headed down to the river with my river helper and we found our place in the water. And at that point, you know, we had a beautiful day. It was really, it was a stunning day. Um, nice warm weather, um, you know, sunshine, the whole thing. Uh, just nice breezes up and down the river. It was great. So I stood in that water and the, I, I stood next to him and I literally closed my eyes and I could feel the sun on my face and I exhaled. And I like to say at that point, when I exhaled, I felt as if the previous 10 months of my life had been washed down the Salmon River. I felt like the, the cancer was leaving me. I felt like all of the pain that I'd been through um, with the chemo and the radiation and all the pain that the cancer had caused my family, um, the emotional toll it had taken me, it was going away. And at that point, I realized I needed to continue fly fishing. That's exactly what I did. Um, so I've become what I'll call, you know, a, a decent angler. Um, I know how to catch fish. I know to hold, know how to know how to hold my own on the water. But more importantly, you know, I think what casting for recovery brought to me was not only uh, a means of what I'll call healing, um, because as Lisa spoke earlier, uh, this has never been about fishing for me. This is has always been about um, being in nature. And I like to say that I have become best friends with mother nature and the fishing is a small part of it. What I have found with um, fly fishing in general is the community, the community of people that surround you in order to help you learn um, to buddy up again and, and go fishing and, you know, say, hey, let's go, <laughs> let's go wet our line type of thing. And it's really, uh, it's, it's been more of an experience than, than I can ever really express to people. Um, I do really believe that, you know, this organization has personally changed my life. And it changed my life by one, giving me the opportunity to attend a retreat, um, be in touch with so many fantastic people. And that's why I actually give back to the organization because I want women who were in my own circumstance to come into a Casting for Recovery retreat and walk away with the same feeling that I have. And as a volunteer now, um, I have to say it's been extremely rewarding for me to actually sit back and watch sometimes, um, like all of my hard work as far as, part, as far as participant coordinator is usually done before we get to the retreat. So when I get to the retreat, I get to keep an eye on everybody. And what's really nice is that I do see that joy. I've seen women walk into the water and come out of that water and look at me and say, I didn't get it. I didn't get it until I stepped into the water. And, you know, they'll say, I found my people, you know, they, they, they've been surrounded by women that came in as complete strangers. Um, and after that two and a half days, those, those women are friends and they'll remain friends. So this is actually um, a group of women that I fish with and we are all breast cancer survivors. We were brought together by Casting for Recovery. And we would not have met each other had it not been for Casting for Recovery. I like to say that everyone's journey is different. You know, I, um, I didn't ask for breast cancer. I didn't go looking for it, it found me. And I made my way through it, but I made my way through it um, with the help of Casting for Recovery and a fly rod in my hand. And I, I wouldn't change a thing. Uh, we're a absolutely wonderful organization that are changing lives of, of these women that attend um, every single year, uh, which again is why we're so excited to be moving forward into the 2021, um, uh, tw yeah, 2021 retreat season. So you might um, ask, you know, how you can help. We've already talked. It's a great way to, to help is donate flies. What we do uh, as part of the retreat experience is we give each of the women their own um, fly box and it's really packed full of uh, great flies that we have had from all over the place. I, I have flies that I'm not even expecting end up on my doorstep in the mail some days and there's just little notes in there say hey I saw your note on your website or I saw your note on your Facebook page 
you know, enjoy the flies and they'll have a card in there. So we, we certainly am, uh, really love all the flies and these women. It's a, really a highlight of the treat that they absolutely love it. They can't believe actually the generosity of the, the people that have tied them and have, um, you know, donated them. So of course I talked about follow us on Facebook. We do have a Facebook page. If you're on social media, like us, um, we try to keep things updated in there and, you know, keep people um, informed of what's happening. And then of course, um, our 2021 retreat season is going forward, uh, but we do have women that can apply for the 2022 retreat, retreat, retreat season. So if you know anyone who is a breast cancer survivor or in the midst of treatment, then I certainly encourage them to apply for the program. And of course, we have volunteer opportunities. Um, volunteering for the organization is extremely rewarding, whether it be from River Helpers um, to help and at a fundraiser, we have lots of, um, you know, there's many chances to, to help out. And of course, um, donations. We are a nonprofit organization and accept donations. Uh, we do ask for any financial donations that they're earmarked to our upstate New York Casting for Recovery Retreat. So they come directly to our upstate New York CFR group. And you can check us out here on our castingforrecovery.org. Um, there's lots of information about the program. Uh, there's volunteer applications and it's worth taking a look at and, and just being informed about what's going on even on from a national perspective. And then what I'd like to say is thank you. Um, I know this is the second time that I have spoke for Canon Dagua and I really appreciate the fact that you've invited me back. Um, you know, you guys are great supporters of CFR. I recognize that. And on behalf of the Upstate New York CFR crew and myself, um, we really appreciate your support. And I hope you catch a lot of big fish soon, guys. I can't wait to get out in the water too. <laughs> oh, all right. Hey, well, Lisa, thank thanks, thanks for your briefing and what you what you're doing. And we'll try to send you some more flies in the future. <laughs> and I forget the gentleman's name, but I told your male counterpart that. Uh, I would be willing to help at the retreat if uh, you need extra help. So you must have you must be talking about Steve then, right? So Steve, yes, Steve yes. Olafson is our program coordinator. Yep. So if you want, Al, um, if you go ahead and you have to fill out a volunteer application, and it's right on that castingforrecovery.org um, website. And then once you fill that out, I will tell you one of the things that's happening due to COVID this year is we're limiting as many people um, as we can. So like Lisa and I will both be at the retreat um, and I think they're gonna actually make me a river helper this year. Oh, so I'll be adding something else to my resume, I guess. Um, but you know, it's um, th they're trying to repurpose as many staff members in there, but I'm not gonna discourage you at all. Please, please apply um, and, and put a note in there. Um, I told Steve to put my note Name down. I don't know if I filled out an application or not. I I can drop him a note though. But go at, go on the website and put the information in. In the meantime, I'll drop him a note and tell him that you're interested. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, that was had been my question is need, if you needed any additional um, river helpers this year. But it sounds like you've got it. Um, have to so control Steve that pretty tight. Is, um, Steve yeah, so Steve organizes the River Helpers. Um, I don't know exactly who he has in mind or, or what they have in mind. I do know based on what we've, you know, been discussing with COVID is the fact that, you know, the more people we can repurpose from a staff perspective, but we do that every year anyway. Um, it's a matter of repurposing as many people as we can on the staff as River Helpers. And then we always have, we need 14 people. So there's always an opportunity, but I don't want to tell you one way or the other. Miss, Mr. Olafson can help us out with that. Okay, I know Steve's a good friend. Eh? So, um, no, it's a very gratifying, um, I had the privilege of being a river helper a couple of times in Long Island when I lived down there. And uh, it's it's so much fun. It, it was really gratifying to to help in that little way. To um, How is, do uh, do the gals catch fish when, <laughs> when they're fishing or how's the fishing? Yeah. Oh, what are you getting? So I'll not my I first never, time. I didn't catch any, but I was with Steve, so I put it on him. 
I didn't catch any either the, the year I went. So, but there are women, I mean, they- oh, and the next closest person to me pulled five out. So <laughs> <laughs> she must've been with Lisa Green. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, that's why you gotta, you just gotta learn to enjoy being out in nature. Exactly. And being oh, and in the fantastic. water and the, ma the magic and artistry of casting, you know, there's, that's the thing about fly fishing. There's much more to it than catching the fish. Yeah, I would I would echo what Lisa said. My my dad was a fly fisherman, but I you know it, that was his escape <laughs> from the family, so he didn't take <laughs> didn't take us out. Um, and my grandfather and you know I saw the movies, and it just had such a mystique for me. So the idea of uh, kind of tackling something new that was was so appealing. Um, after a breast cancer diagnosis and you know to 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 take on something new was was big uh, so it, it was just as fulfilling and and I have become a fisherwoman but I I still don't get out enough but um I, I was just going to suggest if anybody wants to be river helpers to women when they come back if if they can get connected to uh, the Canandaigua TU chapter. I have uh, received a lot of support from the Seth Green chapter after uh, after the retreat and people that offered to take me out. And, um, you know, that, like Lisa was saying, you know, I, you, you, you go once and you think, oh, well, that was awesome, but I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, so I, it was really important to me to have somebody to go out with after. Um, so that's a nice way that you could you could also help out. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, we would actually, we're talking about that in, uh, in our uh, fly fishing school, having more of kind of a one-on-one -on -one, um, relationship with, with people where we just kind of basically be river helpers and, you know, just take uh, people who are exactly. newbies and, you know, teach them some, some of the ropes and, and uh, give them some tips and so forth. So yeah, uh, feel free to uh, pass our names along and uh, to anyone that wants to continue to fish. And, nice. I think it's a confidence factor, like Anne was saying, because I know that even when I got my equipment and I had it up like the first time after the retreat, I was like, okay, I can do this, you know? And, but, you know, it's, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and it wasn't until I, I received some additional instruction that I started to really put it together. And um, I, when I say I'm a decent angler, what I mean is I can hold my own on the water. <laughs> I mean, I, I know how to pick a fly. I know how to, you know, I need to be better at reading water, that type of stuff. But I going back to what you were saying, and I do think it's definitely a confidence factor. Um, but what comes with that is the people, again, that are so knowledgeable, just sharing these little tips where you go, oh, wow, that's, that's, that's what I need to do. Yeah. Well, what would really be helpful to have somebody give you a little coaching on the local waters. You yeah, know? yeah. It's one thing to be up at the Salmon River. Well, what's available What's available locally? And where can I go? And where can I park? And Exactly. Right. That's really helpful. There's those connections you guys have been talking about for sure. You know, how do we, how do we do? So, um, Lisa, I just want to thank you for, for telling me about your experience. Um, this is my first time on this, uh, zoom call with you guys. And I'm sure you're like, who is this lady? <laughs> but, um, your story really moved me. Like I've been somebody who's tied and donated flies to casting for recovery for a couple of years now. And in 2019, I got to be a river helper. Yeah. And uh, it's just so nice to hear the other side of it. Because yeah. I kind of feel like I've been casting into a void in a way. Like meeting up with people in 2019 was great. But hearing what it meant for you personally, and especially that moment where you're letting go on the water, mm -hmm. that's so beautiful. And just thank you for telling us about that. I mean... You're right. That's that's the connection that we all wanted. Like when I first started fly fishing, I thought I'd be bored. So like I had my music and like that lasted for like a day. <laughs> for hours. Don't you guys too? Suddenly you're like, wow, I'm trembling with hunger. Uh, maybe I better. <laughs> I mean, I've got the fishing bug too. If, if I can help you guys, um, you know, um, participants after the event who want to fish. 
I live around the Finger Lakes, um, Ithaca, Seneca County. Anybody out my way, Canandaigua guys, I'll help you guys too if you have some female vets. I know Lindsay. I, I'm just starting to get into this stuff. So um, I, I just wanted to thank you personally for your You're welcome. Thing. And sorry for rambling. It's, it's, it's one of the reasons, you know, like I said, I, I you know, I, I can go on. You guys have seen me do presentations before. I can go on for an hour. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I think it's important definitely to make that connection and understand really the impact that it has. So um, I, it, it's, it's, it's important for me to communicate it to, to you as it is for you guys to hear it from me. So I appreciate that. Oh, well, it's, it's we appreciate both of uh, the presentations. It's really a wonderful uh, night tonight. Um, so, um, one of the things I have, I did record the meeting, so I'm going to uh, uh, put that out on YouTube. And uh, for the folks that uh, weren't able to make it tonight that registered, I'm going to send them that link so they can uh, kind of uh, watch the recording of it. Because uh, I think it's, it's so important, uh, uh, the program and, and just what it does. And and uh, I want to thank both, uh, both Lisa's for helping us out tonight because it was a really uh, special night for us. And, uh, Thank you for having us. Okay. So it's a uh, closing time. <laughs> so I'm um, going to wrap up the meeting. Uh, our next one's uh, May 17th. Mark your calendar now. Um, and uh, for those of you who are looking for somewhere to fish, actually, we're going to be profiling our, uh, our home stream, the uh, Cohocton River. So we'll give you uh, uh, hopefully uh, some tips to help you catch fish down that way. All right. That sounds good. I'll be back. Thank you. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you so much. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Take care.